Act One, Scene Six is a very short scene that is like a traveling scene. Duncan is on his way to the castle of the Macbeths and they, because they're going to have a ceremony there. And we've heard that this is happening, but this is just kind of like a brief little travel interlude between the Macbeths, who just at the end of Act One, Scene Five, have begun to discuss murdering Duncan and Duncan's actual arrival. One of the most important things in this scene is the dramatic irony. When Duncan enters the scene, I imagine he's riding a horse, he comments to Banquo, this castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. And so he's using all these positive words, nimbly, sweetly, pleasant, gentle, and it brings back our previous notion of Duncan as naive and kind-hearted. He again is oblivious to the danger in the castle because he is standing outside the castle where the scene just closed and the Macbeths are planning his murder. And he walks on stage and says, oh, wow, this place looks lovely. It is an important irony that tells us something about Duncan. You also, in this same scene, have a series of bird imagery that um, Banquo enters into the play. And bird imagery is something that is very prevalent in this play. Banquo is talking about the martlet, which is a positive sign. It is a bird that approves uh, of the air. He's saying a guest of summer. So he, Banquo also is kind of oblivious here. And then you have a lot of, of, of a, a big to do. Duncan enters the castle. He is welcomed by Lady Macbeth. And you can hear in her voice a completely different sentiment than in the previous scene when she was all alone summoning the darkness. Here we see Lady Macbeth putting on her face like an innocent flower while being the serpent under it. So she is demonstrating the kind of appearances she wants Macbeth to have. Let's listen to the scene. Castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, the temple haunting martlet, does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty, freeze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed the air is delicate. See, see, our honored hostess. The love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God ill us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point twice done and then done double were poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. <laughs> Where's the thane of Corner? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. <laughs> Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in court, to make their audit at your highness' pleasure, still to return your own. <laughs> Give me your hands. <laughs> Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. Uh, your leave, hostess. So again, you hear the ceremony and all this. Duncan calling Macbeth the Thane of Cawdor. That is Macbeth now. And he keeps exercising that new title to continue to point out to Macbeth that this is what he has earned. And Lady Macbeth using language like 
Um, those honors deep and broad, all our service and every point twice done and then done double, your servants ever. She is laying on pretty thick that she is being the innocent flower by appearances while being the serpent underneath it. 